Hi, and welcome. If anyone is just joining us, welcome to our webinar. Um, What's next? Monsters Fall 2020 hiring report. You are in the right place. We're going to just wait a few minutes and, and let some more attendees uh, sign in before we get started. So um, I will just pause for a moment. And, and while we're waiting, I am curious if people um, what it's like where you are. We are actually the majority of us here are in Boston. Um, and on the East Coast for sure. And we're enjoying a very nice day here today. Um, beautiful fall day. And actually we're heading into a weekend where it's looking like it's gonna be in the 80s. So we're very excited here on the East Coast. Um, if, you, if you're on and you wanna share anything in the chat and let us know what it looks like where you are, I'd love to know where you are and, and what it's like there. All right, it looks like we've got some more people joining us, which is great. Welcome. And we're just gonna let more people join. And we'll start in just a few minutes. All right, Julie, I think we have enough people we can get started. All right, then. Excellent. Thank you. So um, welcome, everyone, to What's Next, Monsters Fall 2020 Hiring Report. I am Julia Gaynor, and I am a senior content manager here at Monster. And uh, before we get started, first of all, you just heard my colleague Meg Goulet, and she is going to be behind the scenes monitoring some of the chat um, and the Q&A. So you might hear her pipe in occasionally. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few little pieces of housekeeping before I introduce the rest of the panel. Um, first of all, we always have commonly asked questions. We do webinars very frequently here at Monster, and if you're a return guest, welcome back. Um, so yes, we will be sharing our hiring report actually after this. Um, we won't necessarily be sharing the slides, but we're, the hiring report that we're going to share with you is going to be a much more comprehensive version of what we're going to share with you in the webinar. Um, and we'll be sending that out afterwards as well as some other additional materials. We understand that in these times schedules change, you may have to jump off, no problem. Um, and if you do have a question as the webinar progresses, please use the Q&A section at the bottom and those questions will go directly to our panelists so that we can determine which of us is the best person to answer. And speaking of Q&A, we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes uh, so that we can answer your questions as they come in. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna get started and um, I would like to um, introduce myself yet again. My name again is Julia Gaynor and um, I work here at Monster. I am the senior content manager and I'm responsible for our um, employer facing content. So white papers and infographics and all of our resource center content to help our customers um, really with their hiring needs. And joining me is my colleague, uh, Carl German. Carl, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I am the counterpart to that. I'm the flip side. I oversee the content for job seekers and candidates, and I also oversee our uh, corporate PR. So I create content for people who need help writing a resume or prepping for an interview and help guide them to the right job. And so before we really dive in, I think, you know, to kind of set the stage of how we came to where we are today and, and why it is that Carl and I are sharing this information is basically, you know, as we all know, back in March, everything changed. The world changed when COVID-19 really started to ramp up. And we here, you know, Carl and I are responsible, like you said, for, for really providing that the helpful tools for our customers, for our job seekers and for our customers. And we right away knew that we had to do something. And so we put our heads together, we put our teams together and we created a, a resource center um, where we were just filling it constantly with, um, with, with articles, with, with 
data. Um, and Carl, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what we did both on the candidate side and the employer side? Yeah, sure. It was, it was, we, we, we had to respond quickly. Things were changing so quickly. It was, as everybody on the call knows, it was a bit chaotic. And so what was happening was we were getting a lot of questions, both from candidates and employers trying to get understanding what was going on. And so we created this resource center and it was really the first time that we pooled our resources and created a content hub and a data hub that served both the employer and the candidate. And usually it's a separate part of the site. And so this was really a, an experiment on our part, but we really felt it was important that the resources that we had were available to everybody wherever they needed them and whenever they needed them. And so, but we didn't do this single-handedly. We, we, it wasn't just me and Julia, we had a team and we created this with our data analytics and market research experts who are here today. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jewel Escano and Maggie Chandler to walk you through what we discovered. Hi everyone, I'm Jewel Escano, Head of Research and Insights at Monster. And um, I do remember when this first kicked off and how chaotic it felt, Carl, and I'm glad we are where we are now. Um, I work really closely with Maggie at C-Space. They're one of our research partners and um, I'll hand it over to, you, Mag over to you, Maggie, to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, we have been working really closely with the, the Monster team here to help them figure out what exactly has been going on with both job seekers and employers during this really uh, tumultuous time. So that's what we're, we'll be sharing with you today. Um, and we can get started walking through some of those insights. Yes, so, um, and, and we know that this, you know, this webinar is entitled What's Next, but in order to really understand what's ahead, we felt it was important to share with you everything we've learned essentially over the last six months, and it's really, really interesting. So I'm going to, again, hand it back over to Maggie and to Jewel and to Carl to walk us through what we learned. Maggie? Well, thanks, Julia. So just a little bit more context um, on who we were speaking to. So we have a community of 500 plus um, employers and candidates that's online and we have been conducting weekly research conversations with them uh, to see how they're feeling, what's been going on for them. Um, and that started in March. So we'll walk through quickly just what we've seen so far. Um, so starting at that initial point here in March, on the seeker side, it was an extremely stressful and scary time. Um, as you all can I'm sure relate to, job losses, stay at home orders, um, big transition for those who are able to work from home. And a lot of people are questioning at this point if it's a good time to be looking for jobs, um, if they should be putting their health on the line by doing so, um, whereas other people are feeling an increased urgency and necessity to find a job. Um, so Carl can share a little bit more about what we saw here. Yeah, so while C-Space was doing their research, we internally were reaching out to our own monster community of candidates and employers, which is in excess of 5 million people. So we were doing weekly polls through our email blasts and finding out what was top of mind and what was really going on, you know, and how did this align with what Maggie's team was discovering? And we found a lot of alignment. And then we found lots of opportunity for us to sort of step in and help leave some of this anxiety and and uh, the, the sort of the chaos <laughs> around it all as best we could. And so some of the things that we found here were not surprising to anybody on this call because I'm sure you've you've experienced some of these yourself. Absolutely. So this is this is for you out there on the employer side. Um, we did see a lot of different emotions, especially around the country here. So a lot of regional differences, um, but just a big sense of uncertainty, fear surrounding the future of their business, how they're going to stay afloat, um, a sense of hope from some people who felt they had gone through it um, or their region wasn't affected. So they were they were feeling OK, but um, most people communicate a sense that, wow, actually our employees, our customers are responding well to this. And, and so that did contribute a, a bit of hope there. Carl, what, what did you see on your end? Yeah, it was, it was interesting in the beginning because it was also new to people. So there was a bit of optimism. There was a sense that, you know, yeah, I think for employers, they felt strongly, you know, they felt good that they could make, you know, remote hiring work. 
you know, some of the seekers were saying, yeah, this work from home thing isn't so bad. I think I could, I could get into this a little bit. So it was, it was, you know, a, a mix there early on, the, the sort of the anxiety, but also a bit of optimism as well. Absolutely. So here we are a little bit deeper into it. Um, and on the seeker side, they had been in it for, for a few months at this point. So they're starting to face some serious challenges. Um, and just that sense of exhaustion, I think we can all, again, relate to. Um, not sure how long this will last and, and worried about what will come. Um, and on the seeker side, there are a few places hiring at this point, but for many, they're feeling like the risks of exposure are outweighing their need for a job. So that's come up again and again is, is really important um, from the seeker, seeker perspective, a lot of anxiety around that. Yeah, and, and that anxiety, Maggie, was, was sort of coupled with the anxiety of going back to work, but also this anxiety of this increased workload that people were feeling with work from home. And so as much as early on, they're like, yes, I can make this work. By June, we were starting to see the first signs of some burnout and, and, and a little bit of like, I, I can go back to work now. I'm, I, I think I'm ready to get back into the office. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so on the employer side, um, at the same time, there's a point that they're really looking for guidance. They've realized this isn't just a short-term thing. Um, the the no return to normal wasn't gonna happen anytime soon. So there need to be some long-term adjustments um, in order to stay afloat. So we did see some optimism come through um, from employees who had found some success in, in their new ways of working, whether it be working from home, as you said, Carl, or um, pivoting in some kind that, that landed well. Yeah, and, and then by the time we got into mid to late summer, there was definitely a shift there. As, as different economies opened across the country, but really it was about schools reopening. And that really opened up a new level of anxiety for not just for working parents, but for employers as well. And so we really saw this desire on both sides for flexibility. And that's going to become a, a, an important thing that we're going to come back to um, as, we, as we go through this, this uh, webinar. Yes, great point. Um, okay, so in this July, August period, sort of towards the end of, of this in-depth research we have been doing, um, for those who had been unemployed for a while or, or furloughed, the financial ramifications of that were really starting to come um, become more real. So that's where the, these emotions of anxiety and, and worriedness um, come, come to light here. Um, and unemployment was about to expire at this point too, so that sort of uh, amplified those feelings. Um, and as Carl said, a lot of this anxiety was also attributed to the uncertainty around return to school. Um, like for parents, they're feeling they have to pivot every day and they've been doing that all summer. What's going to happen next? Is that reflective of, of what you saw, Carl? Yeah, yeah. We saw, th we saw that happening at the same time as what you can see on the screen right now, this uptick in burnout. So people were sort of at wit's end by July, August, and really wanted some sort of sense of like when things can go back to normal. And so we, we really tapped into our, our parent audience to try to get a sense of like what what were the struggles there, and then also talk to the employers about their their uh, approaches to sort of bringing people back and helping working parents as well. Absolutely, and we saw that come up again um, in this last point in in the um, employer view here in July and August. So. I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but we did hear that for a lot of people, the end of summer felt like it should be the end of all of this. And that was sort of a finish line that they had set and, and fall would be a transition. Um, so it became real to people that that may not be the case and um, that they needed to continue adjust, to adjust and, and develop these long-term strategies um, to readjust to hiring, support their employees and in a more effective way than they had been in that, that sort of like band-aid solution period of, of the earlier months. So a big emotional peak here. Um, and I think Jewel has some, some other data that she can share with you about what we're seeing um, as this translated. 
Yeah, as we were, um, while, while you were doing your research at C-SPACE and we were doing the polling at the same time, we were also looking at um, our internal data, which is very fascinating. And Jewel, could you please walk us through that? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just going to highlight a few of these interesting key takeaways that have su surfaced through this time frame. Um, the first is that remote is in the top 10 and remains in the top 10 as both a keyword and location searched. Um, as you see, as you can see at the start of the pandemic, it spiked a little bit. Um, and actually when businesses started reopening, we thought that there was gonna be another decline and we would return to that new normal, but you see in July and August that it's still climbing, indicating that remote is almost here to stay. The next takeaway is looking at work from home. So similar to remote, it spiked at the start of the pandemic um, and it still remains in the top 10 as well. And then the third point here is looking at location searches specifically. And what we've seen is that people are increasingly searching for USA as a search location, broadening that possibility that I can work from anywhere, I can work from home and I don't have to be right in my immediate area. And then the last point here is looking at a local example. Um, we did see uh, bits and pieces of just localized spikes. And this example is looking at Lafayette, Louisiana, which is about 50 miles outside of New Orleans. And in the mid-April timeframe, that was when there was some talk of some businesses reopening and Lafayette in particular was saying that they were gonna reopen some of the unessential businesses while New Orleans was gonna remain closed largely. Um, and so, we, you know, that's likely one of the causes of why that spike happened when it had very little searches prior to that. Um, we see this still, uh, as Carl was mentioning, with education and talking about schools reopening, there's little localized spikes in certain areas with searches related to that, as well as when things are closing down or opening up or the pandemic is spreading in certain areas. This fifth point is looking at um, restaurant related services. So food delivery really spiked at the start of pandemic and kind of tapered and stayed in May and June. Um, and now we're seeing increased searches and in more restaurant related searches as restaurants have started to reopen for search terms like cook, restaurant manager, waiter, waitress, those kinds of things. The next point here is looking at healthcare. Um, it spiked early on as well, and we know that those are that's an area where new jobs were actually being created and where help was really needed. And so seekers were either going because they had the, searching that because they had the skill set, but perhaps also searching because that's where they saw the opportunity was. The seventh key takeaway is looking at warehouse worker, um, which spiked and then kind of plateaued throughout May and June and has since leveled out. Um, at the same time, we've seen an, a year over year increase in material moving jobs. Um, so this kind of shows the supply and demand matching up on those two sides. And then the final point is looking at our new resume postings um, that grew with the initial shutdown of businesses in that late March timeframe um, and then dipped as that optimism faded and people were hesitant to be searching for jobs. And now you see at the end of the, um, the time frame there come going into September, our resume postings are now starting to match what we saw in 2019, perhaps again indicating that we're returning somewhat to, to more normal um, behaviors. And, and this has been so useful, this data. I just wanted to thank you so much, Jewel. Um, and what just to kind of let everybody on, on this webinar know that we've actually been sharing these types of, of key takeaways on a weekly basis. Um, as well as the insights that Maggie and Carl shared on our um, resource center, which is still live right now, and we'll get you a link to it at the end of this. So it's really helpful. It's been helpful for us in terms of figuring out how to not just create content, but also to respond to our customers, um, you know, un in really understanding what's happening um, in the job market. So that all of this is available to anybody um, on a, you know, on a daily basis. We update it um, very frequently. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then moving ahead, you know, so of course there is so much information and it's um, sometimes seems hard to connect the dots. Luckily we have experts on staff that help us with that. And, um, and you know, and so what we did in the, in the hiring report that we'll share with you um, via email after this is we, 
we, we tried to, to connect the dots a little bit so that we could take a look at what we learned so that in order to hopefully help you, um, you know, apply these moving forward in the next, in the next few months and into 2020. So one of the first things that shouldn't, is probably not a big surprise to most of you on this call, um, is that remote hiring and um, working from home are not going away uh, anytime soon. They are here to stay. Um, Maggie, did you want to kind of quickly share some of the thoughts that you, that you had on the insights you had around that? Yes, absolutely. So similar to what we were, were speaking about earlier, employers and candidates alike are realizing that there are some benefits to working from home. Um, and some really want to maintain this as an option going forward. So this is especially true for candidates who don't know how long their health might be at risk in searching for a job. So they're playing it safe, looking for a job that they could do remotely until it might be time um, that they do feel uh, more safety, more security, um, and they're not putting their own health or the health of their families at risk by going out there and searching for a job. Absolutely, and we've done over the course of the last six months, we've um, we've done webinars, we've done, you know, we created a lot of content, we've had a lot of questions, um, and you know, virtual recruitment is certainly here to stay, and um, video interviews are something I think everybody's now becoming more familiar with, and you know, we've been trying to help um, our customers, you know, kind of with some of the basics, and I think really one thing that comes down to is making people feel comfortable with this new virtual world. You know, candidates are just as uncomfortable as we are, and um, and so making sure that you have the right technology set up um, to you know, and and that they have the right technology set up, um, and um, additionally, something that of course is is usually happening at this time of year and still is is college recruitment. And we, um, we had a great webinar earlier this year where we were trying to ask our, you know, some of our customers, what are you doing? How are you handling this? And actually a lot of colleges had already moved to online recruitment um, and virtual recruitment. And so, you know, and, and, and it sounds as though, um, you, know, you know, career fairs, online career fairs, online job fairs are already set up and in motion. And so that's something that, um, you know, is, is, is all, was already in motion and now hopefully would be for, for many of you who are on the call. Um, the next um, big, big takeaway, and, and I know this is something that I'm sure everyone is, is pretty familiar with, is, you know, candidates told us loud and clear from day one and, and in different ways that their safety is, is, is one of their number one concerns. Maggie, would you share some of the insights that, that we learned? Yeah, absolutely. So again, a, a pretty straightforward one um, from candidates here. They are prioritizing their health and safety. As we said before, some are even stopping their job search entirely um, because they don't feel it's safe. So that you you do have a risk of losing potential great candidates if, if they don't have some clarity as to um, what employers are doing to keep them safe at work. So that's something that, that they really are expecting employers to be transparent about. Um, because that, that is just a, an absolute priority for them during this time. Yes, and we've been really advising that, you know, you can, you can make a lot of these, um, these protocols known simply in your job descriptions, you know, really add language to your job descriptions that let it make it clear what protocols you have in place. Um, also in all of your employer branding materials, you know, make it clear that you are a, you are a safe workplace. And in, throughout the entire hiring process, uh, you know, to reiterate, th this is something that is number one um, for, for candidates. And I think, you know, as um, Maggie was saying, what we've, what we've learned is that, and I think a lot of people have felt this, especially with the, the unemployment benefits that were available to, um, to job seekers and to, you know, and to the uh, people who are lo losing their jobs, is that some people chose not to return to work because they feared for their health. And so it, even though it may seem like there's, um, you know, quite a few unemployed people, a lot, the, it, it can be a tight market. And so you still, you're, you know, when, when you can rise above your competition by showing that you offer um, safety protocols, that, that's, that's something that seems to be just kind of like table stakes these days. Um, and the next um, kind of, again, a lot of these are, you know, I think these are these things, we all know this intuitively, but we, we actually have the insights to, to prove that this is what uh, candidates are, are telling us um, is that employers definitely need to, uh, you know, to be strategic and flexible due to the uncertainty of our current environment. Um, Maggie, what were you seeing from, from C-Space? 
Yep, absolutely. So this is one that, that I'm sure you can all relate to, um, and you probably know better than we do, but we have just heard consistently that employers do need um, and, and are planning for just being increasingly flexible around how they're hiring um, and who they're hiring. So not only the ways that they're doing it, but, but who they're looking for, because they may have less time. Um, we've heard from a lot of people as, as their roles have changed throughout the pandemic, they may not have as much um, time to dedicate to hiring. So they need to be using the right tools um, and, and may need help finding those tools to manage potentially an influx of resumes from, from many candidates that they're seeing. So Julia, any tips on how employers could be thinking about that going forward? Well, I mean, you know, I think a lot of it can come down to technology and obviously there's, you know, there's always talk of AI and how important these tools are, but, you know, and I think it depends, you're, you're either, it's either going to be feast or famine and for those employers and recruiters who are being inundated with resumes, particularly, and maybe even from, you know, candidates that they wouldn't normally see. Um, there, it's so important to be able to do that initial screening and use the right AI tools for that, as well as, you know, being able to do skills testing, skills assessment. That's something that we talk a lot about a lot here at Monster um, and sort of, sort of remove that first layer, you know, and then I have to obviously talk about um, some of the tools that we have here. One of our most popular search monster, you know, there on the other side of the table, you may have, you know, a situation where you're in one of the industries that there, there, it is still a tight market. You know, there are some segments of healthcare, I'm sure people know, where it's still very hard to find certain types of, you know, workers. Um, some, some manufacturing segments um, are having a tough time. And, you know, when you have really good resume search technology, you can, you can find the type of worker you're looking for, um, be able to really hone in, um, you know, on the skills you really, really need. And in, in some locations, you know, the, the geographical areas you need. And and so um, I think it's, it, this is where it's important to really drill down to making sure you have the right technology. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, and we've touched on this in a lot of what we've already talked about, but we saw that your employer brand is, is so important. And this is where it was great that we were able to come together, where we were able to take a look at both audiences that we, that we serve here at Monster. And we are so lucky that we have such a, a large pool to, you know, Mar Carl was saying we have over 5 million, you know, um, people in our database and we're able to talk to them. And then with C-Space, we we're able to talk to the same group of, you know, dedicated um, candidates and employers who were sharing what would, you know, their insights with us as well as, as, um, as the Monster data. And what we're, what we really heard loud and clear is that, is that, you know, due to everything we've already mentioned, the health scares, et cetera, that what your company stands for when it comes to COVID safety, basically, you know, COVID-19 safety is very important and how you convey that is important um, to candidates. Um, Maggie, I'm sorry if I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but <laughs> I get passionate about this. Um, the one thing I would add, Julie, is that this is really true for all industries that we spoke to, and it's especially true for frontline employees, because obviously there's so much more risk involved there, um, and they are looking for that transparency. Again, it's table stakes. If they don't have that information, um, and that's something they're prioritizing, which is, which is what we've seen, then it's not likely that they would even apply to that job. So there is a potential here for employers to be losing out on, on valuable high quality candidates if they're not being as transparent as possible um, in their branding. And, and so the COVID uh, safety piece is really, really linked to employer branding in a way that we may not have expected initially. And I think a lot of times, you know, if you don't have in place already, a, you know, a robust employer branding strategy, it might seem overwhelming. And, and, and so, um, and, and it really doesn't have to be. There's some kind of, you know, small steps you can take that can make a big difference. For one thing, job descriptions. I mean, number one, right? Um, all the way up to revamping your career site to, you know, social media strategy. There's a whole, there's a whole, you know, there's just a number of tactics that you can use. And so um, because it, we are so passionate about it, we're going to have a, an entirely different webinar devoted to it. And we're creating an employer branding guide as we speak. Um, and that will be in October. So we will reach out to everybody on this and hopefully they'll be able to join us because we're going to, it's, we're going to have some really great expertise to help, you know, um, you know, talent acquisition professionals 
at all levels, whether you're in a small business or whether you work at an enterprise level. So we hope you can join us then. Um, and then finally, looking ahead, this is the part of our presentation that I, um, I think a lot of you might be looking forward to, which is, you know, an opportunity for us to take a look at, um, to take a look at some of the industries and the jobs that we think are going to be growing. And I will pass this right back over to uh, Jewel to share what we have, um, what we've been able to determine. We think we give you a little look into the future based on, based on data and insights. Yeah, and so pulling these lists together was a bit of art and science because there's no one silver bullet that's going to give us the answer. But what we did was we looked at our own jobs data trend, had some interviews with experts, and also looked at BLS trends to help see pockets of opportunity, um, knowing that overall job counts are down and unemployment is higher. Um, and I'm only, I might only touch on a few um, given timing, but I'll start with light industrial. I had mentioned earlier that we saw an uptick in searches for warehouse workers. And at the same time, this is one category, including types of jobs like um, packers and packagers, material movers, light truck or delivery service drivers. So it kind of um, bridges transportation and manufacturing or warehousing. Um, and we actually see uh, increase year over year, which is different than other categories. So a lot of opportunity there. Carl, yeah. did you want? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to jump in there, Joel, <laughs> because that's a sector that I'm, I'm fascinated by and I really want to be tracking that. There's, there's potential there for so much growth, especially as we go into the seasonal hiring. Um, time of year. And so that's why that um, warehouse worker is on that top jobs list because we saw consistency throughout the end of the summer into the fall and that we're anticipating that to continue through seasonal hiring. Yeah, and I think to build off of that related to seasonal hiring, I'll jump to retail um, because we had a number of conversations with um, representatives from the National Retail Federation and they have a really positive outlook on um, retail jobs going into the holiday season. Um, of course, shopping is not going to be the same as in prior years, but um, there's still an expectation that there's going to be some growth in retail jobs. And then looking at technology, year over year job postings are over down, are down at Monster and just in the category in general overall. But tech has, um, you know, been evolving businesses through this time, um, especially as a lot of companies are moving to remote working and needing to build teams to be able to support that. Um, we talked to an, an, an expert as well, um, and he had mentioned jobs like network design and security, user experience and U UI and software developers to help us communicate and function in this new virtual world that we're living in. And then in our own monster data, um, we've also tracked some increases in jobs like computer user support specialists, like those help desk kind of roles, um, also at a temporary level, um, because companies are, are needing that kind of staff to help their employees as well. And then um, I'll touch, oh, did oh, you wanna? Sorry, don't keep going, Jill. Oh, no, go ahead, if you want no, to. No, I was just gonna, I was gonna say that, you know, we, we were also seeing some of these jobs related to remote. So keeping in mind that something like that, that uh, computer support network uh, is something that somebody can do from home. And so when you, when you look at those top jobs, some of those totally make sense for appearing there because they could be done remotely. Great. And then the last one that I'll touch on is healthcare. Um, which we saw at the start of pandemic um, really kind of at its height with specific roles that were really related to hospitals like nurses, critical care nurses, respiratory therapists, people that were really going to help address the needs of the pandemic. But now as um, businesses are opening back up and communities are opening and more non-essential types of um, non-emergency elective type of services are um, coming back, um, there's an expectation that there's going to be an increased need for other healthcare types of roles um, on the management side as well as on the actual healthcare delivery side. Um, so BLS reported over 200,000 jobs added combined in the months of July and August. Um, and then in our own data, we've seen increases in postings for jobs like medical assistants, opticians, physician assistants, 
dental assistance, and then hospital jobs as well, um, with some of those ancillary services like lab technicians, um, surgical technicians, and pharmacy type roles. And Jill, I'll just hop in there to add um, one thing that I had meant to mention before, but we did see this increase in um, health-related roles to industries that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to come up. So all of a sudden, retail um, retail employers were looking for like a health officer, someone to enforce, encourage employees and customers to wear their masks or to check temperatures, things like that. So this new kind of healthcare realm, and I don't know if you're going to mention this uh, coming up, so don't mean to steal your thunder, but that's something that had come up again and again um, and relates to what you're saying here. Yeah, I, I, I agree that I thought it was interesting to see our community start to name those kinds of roles um, a little earlier on in the pandemic and thinking about the future and what's going to be needed. And we're seeing those popping up now in businesses um, of all different kinds, right? Whether you work in an office or increased security at a, a grocery store, for example. Absolutely. And I think what's, um, again, what's, you know, it's, it's really exciting to share this with all of you, but we actually go over this data weekly at Monster. And, and like I said, we share it in our, um, in our, uh, on our resource center. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's would be, it's kind of like, um, there's a lot of different things people are tracking these days um, in the news related to COVID-19. And, and this is our own kind of job central uh, resource that I think is would be particularly interesting to anybody who's in the hiring um, or job search space, really. So, um, so we'll be sharing that with you. So, thank you so much, Jewel, for going through that, and and Carl, and Maggie, um, and I appreciate everyone's attention. Um, and we're now going to. I'm actually going to toss it back over to Carl because he has been going through uh, the questions that have been coming in and. Uh, he's going to pick a few, um, and it looks like we have, a, yeah, we have a 10 or 15 minutes left that we could devote to questions if we wanted to. Um, so yeah, we got, we've gotten some good questions in here, so let me, let me jump right in there. Okay. Uh, first off, I'm inundated with resumes from different industries than what I recruit for. How do I sort through all the applicants to find the most qualified? Hmm. Do you want to take that one, Julia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that one is like, a, um, it, to me here at Monster, you know, my immediate answer is Search Monster, which is a way that you can, you know, really fine tune your search as you're, as you're going through. Um, and, you know, I think again, I, going back to some of the, the AI tools that are available that are out there, being able to use screening tools um, so that you can immediately screen for the resumes that may not be as um, appropriate to what, you know, the jobs that you're looking for as you're being inundated, um, you know, with, with applicants. And I, I, I think those are some of, some, some of the, you know, and we have a lot of, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of tools at Monster that can help with that because obviously that's a problem. I mean, it's not, it's not a problem. It's, 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 it's the opposite of where we were six months ago. Um, and, but it's a new challenge um, that, that again, I, I think um, our search monster tool and, and also some of these screening, screening tools can really help with. Oh, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We got another, uh, we got a, a question. The, that's sort of the opposite where, and now I'm scrolling through to find it because it came through and I thought it was very interesting, where they're, they're not getting the, um, instead of an influx of resumes, we're getting very few and the ones we're receiving are not updated with correct contact information. What tips do you have for attracting more candidates? And I think that this, this actually came through, Julia, just as you were talking about employer branding. And so I was like, maybe we just need to go back a little bit more just to, sort of reinforce that a little bit more for um, people to sort of attract the right candidates. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, and again, I think so much comes down to obviously your job descriptions, um, but, and so, so again, just repeat the question one more time. Is there not, they don't have the right information in their application? Yeah, no, it's, it's they're, they're, they're getting an influx of resumes. They're, get, they're not getting enough resumes and the ones they're getting are not updated, they don't have the right contact info. So they're basically not getting the right kind of candidate. So what, the, what tips do we have That's to help them attract better what that, candidates? 
Well, okay, so to attract better candidates, I think it certainly, it certainly you know, comes down to your employer branding and, um, and making sure that you're obviously advertising for the role in the right way. But what, you're, what this question is making me think, and I wonder if what they're asking is um, a lot of times, um, especially I think in, with for our staffing clients, there, there's a problem where you know, applicants, you know, uh, resumes that come in or resumes that, that, that uh, our customers have don't have the right information. And, they're, um, and, and so we actually, we're, one thing that we're doing, I, I know that our, our, some of my staffing colleagues are working on is a lot of data hygiene um, maintenance and helping our customers to make sure that the resumes they're receiving have all that correct information. Because as everybody knows, you know, sometimes even though you may have a lot of resumes in your system and they may even seem like they're appropriate for the role that you're hiring for, they, they may have an incorrect email address or phone number or, you know, out of date information. So um, that's something I just want to mention because I do think, I know that we're actively working on that um, it, definitely in a staffing space. And I think data hygiene is something that we're really focused on because there's so much, um, everything is, is, is digital. And if, if your data isn't clean, if you don't have the correct uh, information, then, then sometimes the um, the resumes that you're able to to look at are aren't aren't very useful. Hey Julia, yeah, Meg, I'm gonna jump in for a second. Do we have an upcoming um, article or resource piece on that? We do. Please <laughs> <laughs> rise in my mind. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. In fact, we actually have one that's live on the on um, our hiring site on um, hiring.monster.com. Um, and also, I know that one of our, my colleagues, Danny Ashraf, is going to be giving a presentation um, at Staffing World all about this. So it's top of my mind, which is, I think, where I, why I went there. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And Meg, is there anything that I'm missing? Because I know that it's, you, you've been thinking about this as well. I have. Yeah, I think, I just, I think it's such an interesting topic. And, you know, I've seen some comments in the chat about data as well. Um, so it's just so important now that everyone's taking the time, whether you are, um, you know, seeing unprecedented hiring or, you know, you are slowing down. There's so much opportunity that can be had during this moment. And uh, one of the big things that, of course, is top of mind for a lot of people is refreshing data and reviewing what you have, um, because, you know, obviously it all starts with good data, right? So uh, I love that we're developing an article about that. I thought that was something you were working on, so I'm excited to hear that it's already live. It is. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> uh there's another topic that's coming up in the in the chat and in the Q and A. That's um, a lot of jobs we hire for are remote. No surprise there. Is there a way to assess whether a candidate will be productive while working from home? So, Carl, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will take that one. I will talk about that. This is something that we actually talk about quite a bit with our with our seekers and and. And we really try to drive home the idea of um, the key the key things that you want to be able to do when you're working at home and be successful is is you want to set up the right workplace you want to be able to set up the right technology and you want to have clear communication so that's going to come from both sides but we are really advising the, the seekers to really start that at home when you set up your workspace make sure it's it's in the right part of your home make sure that you have the technology that you need and that you're, you're communicating with your boss and i think that that's going to go back and forth um for the hiring side as well check in over communicate it's essential and we're, we're we're really big proponents of that here at monster we are always dming and emailing and um so that's that's a crucial step and something that we're really advising our our candidates um to do constantly check in with your with your supervisor and the, and the same back make sure that um expectations are clear that you know when things are due and and that you know they have the tools that they need um i think that a lot of a lot of candidates and a lot of seekers are eager to be productive everybody wants to be productive at work and and so they want to be able to demonstrate that and so i think it's really important that um, employers explain what what that looks like what does success look like and how do you how do you set that parameter so over communicating make sure they have the technology tools and then making sure that they are comfortable where they are and that, that they have what they need. So that's those were the key takeaways. And I think just to jump on this, I think one of the number one questions we got over the last six months from our customers is to helping to un with um, remote onboarding. 
Um, and that's really where I, I think that, you know, we've, we did a webinar on it. We've done a lot of content about this, this idea of, you know, helping to transition workers who may not have ever worked from home before to really get them on board so that they understand, you know, what the expectations are, all of what you're just saying is over, you know, over communicating and also kind of welcome them into the, to, to your culture. Um, in ways that I mean, it's it's a whole other skill set, um, and it's uh, definitely a, a new challenge. But but you know, it's something we we focused on a lot in terms of kind of help trying to help our customers with content here. Yeah, and a, a related question that came through was sort of, you know, um, are there any specific things that employers are looking for in their remote workers? And I think, and I'm, I'm going to ask Maggie because I remember this coming up when we were talking to the community about sort of that transition to work from home and, and the employers were sort of figuring out what it was that they needed. And, and do you remember that, Maggie? I do, yeah, I was thinking of that. Um, so we were hearing like, how, how are you supposed to understand and, and measure tech skills of, like you were saying, Julia, for some people who have never worked from home before. So that's a really tough, tough spot for both sides um, of the equation here. And I think the big thing that employers were looking for is, is just a sense of flexibility from, from the candidate side um, and being able to, um, like you were saying, Carl, over communicate so on, um, just to make sure that that's something that they can deliver on. So that, that would be my take. Um, I think flexibility and tech skills were the top two things that employers were looking for, which makes sense. And I'll yeah. just add, just to add to that too, when we look at job postings in general, um, we do see increases year over year in certain skills and flexibility is definitely there. Things like customer service and communication, um, security, those things that they wanna hold close and keep important to the brand, but also help to be able to keep um, keep the productivity up. So job descriptions themselves are also demonstrating that um, that need. Yeah, and one other thought, I'm sorry, that just came to mind was teamwork. That that was really, really important. Really, really I was important. just going to jump in there on that yeah, one. I can't yeah, I forgot that. So that was another thing that, especially if people are, are welcoming new um, employees virtually, uh, supporting that culture and building that team is incredibly important. Um, so that's something that employers are looking to to support and support their existing employees as well as their new employees and in, in, um, in being a great team member. Yeah, and, and when we were polling candidates, the flip side of that was when we asked them, what's the thing that they miss the most about going, going to work? It was teamwork, it was collaboration, and, and they were missing their, their coworkers. And so I think that this, uh, I think that candidates want to shine on that front right now. And so I think there's an opportunity for uh, employers to look for that. The people want to be a part of a team and they're really gonna be uh, eager to be collaborative and really shine in that front. So, um, and then I saw one other interesting one come through. How do I know when I can really start hiring again with so many changes happening all the time? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll also, I'm definitely going to pass this on to Jewel, but I will, I have to put another plug in for our resource center that has all of our data that we update on a very frequent basis, usually weekly. Um, and because we're, you know, so we don't have a crystal ball. Um, I wish we did, but we do have, we do have data and, um, and Jewel, you know, if, I don't know if you have any of them, even more kind of recent trends that you've noticed that you want to share. Yeah. Yeah, so I will say definitely tap into the hiring report. I know I only touched on a few of the industries earlier, but there's a lot more detail on where the opportunities are there. Um, but in the more recent weeks, I'd say the last three or four weeks, we've started to see a leveling out of some of the search words and going back to, in addition to remote and work from home being added, we've seen a shift back to a lot of the top keywords before the pandemic becoming at the top of the list again in a steady, more paced way. Um, so it seems like people are eager to get um, back to that normal that we're all eager for. Um, and definitely use the data that we're releasing and updating um, because things are changing. And I think it helps us all kind of stay focused and um, 
because there's a lot of noise, a lot of information out there, and it's a way for us to just um, stay the course and kind of see really where the opportunity to, opportunities are as we're layering all this data together. Definitely. Um, Carlos, did you have any other questions? Or I had something I wanted to kind of add to. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Still going through. Sort of supporting, um, you know, and helping. Um, employees and new hires adjust to all of these changes. You know, one of the stats that stands out to me is from one of our polls was that 75% of candidates said that to help adjust to, you know, these challenges with um, having, you know, um, kids in school and working families and, you know, having to, you know, to, to support all different family members, 75% um, said that they think that, that um, employers should have offer more flexible work schedules. And, um, and, you know, and, and I think that when companies respond to things like that, that is, that's one thing that you can do, right? This, they say they want flexibility. So you try to give them flexibility. And I know that a lot of companies, and we've written about this a lot, especially on, on the seeker side, is what companies are doing to help their, to help their um, employees. And, um, and so even, even here at Monster, you know, we, we, we actually just rolled out some new initiatives that are helping us, um, you know, giving us a little bit more flexibility so that we can take care of our family if needed. And, um, so, you know, and it's, and, it, and it's something that I, I think companies are, are doing on, on a, you know, more and more um, is, you know, kind of that idea that it doesn't, you know, if, if you work in, in, if it's possible, doesn't necessarily matter when you get your work done, just if you get your work done. Um, and I don't know if I, any of you wanted to add to that, um, but it's something I think we're seeing a lot of and we've been covering a lot. Yeah, I think it relates to one of Carl's earlier questions about productivity and productivity not necessarily meaning you accomplish something in the nine to five, right? And giving, making sure that employees are getting the tools and resources to be productive and maintain that productivity and kind of be on their side with it. So I like what you're saying, Julia, and the things that Monster are doing. All right, Carl, anything else? Oops, sorry, I was going back and forth between my mute, unmute, hitting the <laughs> wrong button there. <laughs> um, I have some specific questions about some of the data. So, Jewel, I, I think I can answer this one, but back me up on this. Somebody wants to know, uh, when we were talking about uh, top jobs, the insurance underwriter, and they want to know, do you find that insurance underwriter is searched more than insurance producer? And I'm gonna say yes, because I'm not familiar with the insurance producer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn that back to you because you're deeper into the data than I am. Yes, I would say yes. And I think you could also just think that they might also just be searching for insurance. Um, so broader searches sometimes are what are happening and it could be a variation of those, but as long as insurance is always included, you're good to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then uh, another question sort of, again, for you, Jewel, that I think you can answer is, are specific positions more likely for an employer to see employees want as a remote worker or work from home? So are there more positions that we're seeing a demand for that position to be remote or work from home? Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes we can't get the why as to why people are searching, but when we look at um, keywords that are searched with remote, it's things like data entry, customer service. We've seen some like web developer and creative roles, um, types of jobs that you, that I think people assume can be done at home. Um, and some of like the technical analyst IT types of roles. Um, so I think if the question is, is kind of like how to help candidates see that your job is remote, is that, is, there, is that right, Carl, what you were asking? Yeah, they're, they're trying to figure yeah. out which, which positions are the, the candidates sort of seeking mostly to be remote, and so. Yeah, yeah, and I would say it was those. And then also earlier on in the pandemic, we did see like remote healthcare mm -hmm. or some of these more broader types of jobs where it was paired with an industry, you know, like remote, I don't think people would search remote light industrial, but um, driver types of roles are those types of roles too. Yeah, and, and, and Jill, do you remember we were seeing some of what we were calling that business continuity, where you would see some of those jobs shifting to more of a, a, a demand for that type of work that could be done remotely, the, the 
analysts, the business analysts, the insurance underwriters, and things that were keeping businesses going early in the pandemic when there wasn't, nobody really had a sense of how long this was going to last. And so mm -hmm. we were seeing a lot of activity around that type of work. And then we were starting to see that coupled with remote as a location. So it was sort of, a, you know, to answer the, the person, the, question, you know, it was kind of across a bunch of industries there. And our seekers were very clever in how they were trying to get that information out of the data. So um, it was, it was, um, it was good. And then do we have time? We have five minutes left. So we do have one last good question that I believe we were just talking about this earlier today. So what are your thoughts on candidates who have been furloughed and are waiting it out to be terminated? Will employers view that time out of work, six to 12 months, as detrimental to their consideration. And I feel like we were just talking about this, about that gap and looking at that gap and how are, how are employers looking at it and then how are you know, candidates taking, uh, using that as well. And if anybody wants to jump in on that, I can talk on the yeah. side. I think Carl, what we were talking about is more from the candidate side, right? And how do you demonstrate some of the trans Verbal exactly. skills or like being able to show that you're productive. Um, I, I think one of the things that we saw in our data that we thought we tried to confirm with the C space communities was are people not looking for jobs or going back to work because of unemployment checks? And I think you would think that's the case, and maybe there's a lot of people who might think that and so they're talking about it a lot, but at the same time, what resonated more and what was coming out among the candidates as we've heard from Maggie is that they are not looking for jobs because they're concerned about their health and safety, that they're gonna put those things first and it might not be worth it to put their family at risk and those kinds of things. Um, so I think the first is just maybe don't assume that that's why they're staying furloughed and just waiting it out. Um, and it comes down to kind of the assessment part that Carl, you were talking about and really helping to candidates to tell that story. But on the employer side, um, asking those questions that maybe are not typical questions to ask and understanding that sometimes being productive is like taking care of your children or having to balance non-work things with work. Um, and I don't know if I'm really getting to the answer, but these are complicated times and there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that candidates sometimes have difficulty, as we've heard from the community too, articulating all of that. Um, so anything you can do to help them tell that candid story, I think is would be really helpful. Yeah, and any kind of gap that somebody has, um, you know, in, in their employment, um, we, we always advise seekers to sort of address that. Like when you have an opportunity to talk to a recruiter or a hiring manager, don't shy away from it. You know, a lot of, there are different reasons why people have a gap in their employment and it could be, and particularly at this time, like you were saying, Joel, it, it could be that they, they needed to do it for, for health reasons or for personal reasons. And that's usually a, a major factor there. And so we always advise um, our seekers to sort of Think through how you know how you want to approach that, but don't shy away from it, and, and really, um, and particularly demonstrate how you were being productive during that time. Because my guess is that a lot of people, if they've been furloughed or at home right now, they've got free time, and their chances are they're they're using their time wisely. So. Well, I know we're running up against the clock and, um, and I, I so appreciate everybody for, for sticking with us and, and I think it's really interesting stuff and I super, super appreciate Maggie for joining us, obviously Carl and Jewel. Um, and, um, you know, we are going to be sending you all um, the hiring report in full. Um, and you will also be getting some other related content via email. And then, as you can see here, we put on, on the screen our, this is the, where you can find our, um, basically our COVID-19 resource center, which currently is a called hiring and uh, hiring in the job search in the new normal. And so you can find that at www.monster.com backslash COVID. And once you're there, you could have an opportunity to look at the employer side or the candidate side, and both are um, equally interesting. Um, and you know, we we really appreciate you, appreciate you being here. We hope you can join us for our next webinar. 
Um, we have several coming up. Um, the one that I did mention is in October is employer branding, which I think will be fantastic. Thank you again to all of you for joining us today. And, um, and, uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your week and weekend.